Okay, welcome back everyone. Uh, for those of you who are returning and welcome uh, to those of you who are here for the first time. Uh, welcome to this afternoon's Catapult Lockdown Virtual Salon. Um, I will be in discussion with Rachel Chin, filmmaker um, from Jamaica. Uh, before we begin, once again, I'd like to express thanks to the Catapult partners, including the American Friends of Jamaica, Kingston Creative, and Fresh Milk for making these salons possible. Please feel free to ask questions um, in the comment section during the talk, and we'll get to those during the Q&A segment at the end of our conversation. Uh, without further ado, welcome, 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 Rachel Chin. Hi. Hi, how are you doing? I'm okay, I guess. <laughs> Just very <laughs> nervous. I can't, I really can't. I really can't lie. <laughs> <laughs> well, I mean, well, let's let's start off right right where um, with your your most recent um, exercise, Trey Town. Um, tell me about about the film and about your your role in in uh, that pro product project. Yeah, so Trey Town is a short film. Uh, it's still it's currently in development because the short film is a proof of concept for a series that they're hoping to move into production. Um, it's about a young up-and-coming politician in Jamaica who is trying to navigate, you know, the very barbed social sphere that comes with um, campaigning for a seat when she has a very um, personal secret. So, um, so I was a story editor for that. Um, it's written by Latay Williams and it's directed by Nadine Rollins and I'm blanking on his name, which is really embarrassing. <laughs> it's. Uh, I'm gonna look it up, and I'm gonna. I'm gonna. I'm gonna. I'm gonna. Okay. I'm gonna well, tell, tell us but, what a, yeah. for, for those of us who don't know. What is a story editor? What is your your responsibility on a film project? So, a story editor is somebody who works in the development of the of the film, which is before they actually go into production. Um, it's much like a, an editor in publishing or I guess like news would, it's like when you have a writer that they're working on their project, they often have an amount of closeness to the work that, you know, uh, makes it difficult for them to ask the sort of questions that they need to get it to function the way that they want. So it's my job to really figure out what it is that the writer is trying to accomplish and what is the, the story that they're trying to tell and to look within the script to see you know, where that has or has not happened um, just yet and to talk to them about you know, the various ways in which they could approach this, you know, like the, the kinds of issues that come up in the script that they have over the course of like various drafts. So I don't really um, like, um, give suggestions or recommendations. It's really breaking down to the core of the, the narrative. Like, what is it that this person is trying to say and how best can I facilitate this, this story that they're trying to tell? And is that, I mean, are you in conversation with the writer on a, like, at, at what stage does that conversation start? As a, when they're just kind of forming the story and they have a treatment or are you waiting for a first draft? So for, I usually come in once there's a, like a producer. So when they are planning to go into production, like officially that's when you would speak to a story editor. And the idea is that you want the script to be the best, at its, at its, you know, the best stage that it can be before you actually start um, investing more time and more, you know, legs on the ground. Sure. Right, and um, so usually there is, a finished draft that I would have to read through, and normally I would give coverage. Usually for um, short films, I would sort of um, break down like my first impressions and you know what I think it's it's done very well, and then start to ask a lot of the questions that I have reading it. Like, what is it that you know? And these aren't really sort of like the I guess like the good kind of questions. You know what I mean? You know, like the this is like. Um, what is the implication of this? Like, sort of, um, it's really more of 
why is this character um, doing this? Like, what is it that they are um, trying to accomplish? And what does that do for the story if that they act in this way in this instance, but or in this instance, they trying to, you know, um, pull apart the narrative about as much as it can withstand it with the, you know, understanding that you're, there's going to be another, there should be another draft for me to look at. Well, I mean, so, it puts you, you know, in some ways um, in a very delicate position with a writer, you know, oftentimes when we talk about filmmaking, we talk about the writing phase as being like the most kind of intimate and precious phase. And everything else after that is kind of brutish and, you know, uh, just a, a, a hard slog to the end, right? Um, but that first um, action of writing the story is where one singular artist really gets to sit and, and pour themselves out. So what you are kind of the person who is the, the gatekeeper between that singular process and when this starts to move into, you know, a more... Uh, active production phase. So what is that like in, when you're interacting with writers? I mean, is it, how, how do you get them to, to kind of part ways with things that they may think are, are, are important in the story, but really don't drive the narrative? That's like, the thing is, it's very, very delicate. You're right, because, um, you know, this is something that I haven't really been doing, I guess, for, you know, that long. Um, it's been over a year now, but just the various people that I speak to, they're all artists in just very different ways. I think some people, you know, that they're, they're, they think of themselves more as a director. Some people think of themselves mm -hmm. more of a writer. And, you know, the approach has to change based on the person because it is, a, I won't, don't want to say it. I, like I don't want to like demean the work that therapists do, but it is you know it's very psychological. Um, uh, so some people if they they are very close to the work, not just in you know in terms of perspective, but in just terms of like emotional mm -hmm. significance. And you know it's, sometimes it's really trying to sometimes it's walking through people, you know, trying to get them to understand that you're asking all these questions in service of the narrative it's not you know the fact it's not that you don't know what you're talking about it's mm -hmm. not that you know you can't communicate an idea it's just that you really need to crystallize you know distill what the yeah. idea is and how do you make that as apparent as you can to your audience because the thing about film is i think in like many respects it is just entirely a performance. Like it's, I think, you know, like you have things like theater and like dance where you undertake it with the understanding that you have an audience. But the thing with film, especially when you have so many um, different oh, layers um, of, la of yeah, it, you have yeah. a lot of distance, you know, from the actual audience. You might right. not actually ever, there's like, you're gonna have different audiences. You might not actually um, have to be in the room with them. But you know, I think for a lot of a lot of projects, they really do need a bit more um, consideration of the kind of conversation that you're trying to have with, with audience in particular. Right. Yeah. Well, I you know when we when we talked um, initially before this conversation, you know this this thing that you wrote about in your your statement to Catapult. Um, was really interesting to me. You know, you said that um, that you can you've come to the understanding that that fil filmmakers, and particularly Jamaican filmmakers, are very concerned with cultural authenticity. Right? Um, can you a kind of well, first of all, kind of give us a, a an overview of what the media scene is like in Jamaica? Um, and then, you know, in terms of like the demographics and who, like who are the practitioners, um, but also about what kind of characters you're seeing coming to the fore. Like, what what characters and what scenarios are people are filmmakers focusing on? Mm -hmm. So, 
this is a, you know, this is a very broad overview and I don't want to, you have to start with like some really um, broad strokes, I think for this, sure. because it's really, it's really interesting for me coming back home, having been abroad for a few years and being involved in the filmmaking scene, which before I left, I had really had no idea what it was or what it was like. I just, did, as far as I knew it, there wasn't one. Mm-hmm. But then to come home and um, have people who are, you know, industry professionals who've been working in a very, like, corporate or commercial um, setting for a long time, and they're, you know, they finally feel that they're in a position that they can um, move into more, you know, personal storytelling, Not more, yeah. like, you know, um, so they're, you know, they're people who are, you know, they're, you know, technically just like so adept and then there are people who are i think you know i think this is like last year um caramac had in, they, they had established their film production mm-hmm. major so that's you know very very young um student filmmakers who are you know thinking about what it is to come up up against people who you know had to sort of figure their way out. And then you also have people who consider themselves um, Jamaican because of their, you know, their heritage, like they grew up abroad in like the UK or in the States. And they're very interested in reconnecting with the, with the, the culture and the landscape in, in the films that they make. And, you know, and it is just really fascinating because like, uh, you know, just like across I guess like all of that, you do have people who are very, I guess like like primarily concerned with what it is to be a Jamaican filmmaker and to make a Jamaican film. And what do you, I mean, for, for you um, as, a, as a Jamaican filmmaker yourself, I mean, do you feel like you can put your finger on what exactly that is? No. <laughs> can, can anyone, I mean, is anybody kind of like saying, well, these are the 10 identifiers of, of a Jamaican filmmaker or a Jamaican film? So I think for me, like, I just sort of, you know, as a very personal um, aside, like, I think I sort of um, made peace with the fact that I'm not, I think, what people think of when they think of a Jamaican person, you know? Um, like, I don't know how to, it's, it's, I don't really know how to explain this without rambling. And I'm gonna try to, I'm trying to, I'm trying to be as relevant as possible. <laughs> <laughs> well, yeah, I mean, um, you know, like, I'm not, yeah, this, this you know, question like, of, yeah. There's just people are concerned. I think, you know, people are concerned with different things in general, but I think Jamaicans are very, very proud to be Jamaican and for me it's just kind of like it just happened you know what I mean like I didn't try very hard to be born Jamaican so it 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 I think I've kind of made peace with the fact that I don't have this sort of fire you know what I mean in that in that in that um respect and I will you know I think honestly it has given me it has it was like a weird kind of distance when I was growing up but now it's I've just sort of made like I said I made peace with it and it's it's really interesting seeing the way people think about the way that they carry themselves in the world and I think for Caribbean artists and you know as a region it is something that it's inherited because you have to think of yourself as you know, like artists, like asterisk, you're not like um, considered mm-hmm. mainstream. The, the pre- prefix, you know. And you're, you know, you're yeah, constantly- Woman artist, you're, black artist, gay art, whatever. Yeah, you're, gonna, you're constantly aware of what it is to be um, viewed by an outside um, culture, mm-hmm. whether that's colonial or, you know, neo, neo-imperialistic. It's just, you know, what value do you have in your situation? Would you? You're like neglected, but you're like constantly surveilled. It's just, it's really, it's really interesting because it you understand why what it means for these people to be able to tell their own stories, 
from their own perspective. But it but, really does inform so much of the work that they do that I don't think there's really um, really any separating it for I think a lot of the artists that I've inter like I've spoken with and I've interacted with since I've um, joined the film scene here. Well, I mean that that kind of introspective, um, I guess complexity that you're you're talking about when you discover these moments of disconnect with the with the mainstream or with the popular culture right mm -hmm. um especially sorry, oh, sorry. <laughs> especially you know popular culture that is specifically designed for foreign consumption mm -hmm. right i think you know Coming from Barbados, when when I I went to Jamaica, my my feeling was is that oh I'm going to a more authentic culture because it didn't suffer under the weight of such a significant mark um, GDP percentage of tourism. Like tourism didn't have that same level of impact, or so I thought. Um, but after a couple of years, I realized that in, you know even though it wasn't quite as prominent as it is in Barbados, there certainly was a very visible cultural construct for the purpose of, of foreign consumption. Um, so for, for people who are, you know, who experience the, 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 the culture outside of that frame, um, you know, do you, feel, do you see work coming out in Jamaica that has that, that kind of, of nuance that is not necessarily feeding into a familiar mainstream um, audience, outsider audience? I think there are, I, th I think um, I can think of a couple of short films that I've seen and I still, I still cannot remember the director's name. So this is like, it's very embarrassing. It was like, what's the point? But uh, there was, I think it was in, the UK, so they were filming the Jamaican um, community there. It's called Jerk, which is about you know a man who had emigrated to London and he's dealing with depression. And um, there's, I mean, Trayton. <laughs> I know I feel like I'm very biased because I worked on it, but that's the thing. It's just like I worked on it and I gone through the process with the writer and right. you know. It's for her, it's like a very, it's a very complicated setup that she's trying to bring a lot of humanity to. It's not, you know, sort of, um, where it doesn't lean into, I think a lot of the, fam like the familiar um, assumptions that you would, I don't want to go give it away, but it's also like mm -hmm. I, it, it, they kind of give it away in the Trinidad and Tobago Film Festival page. <laughs> so the, the, the right. personal secret that she has, this um, politician, is that she's um, having a, an affair with a, a female reporter. And, you know, it's like we're not sort of like playing into like the sort of like very real homophobic despondency of, of the country. It's It's about like the like she's focusing on the personal strife of like having an affair with somebody that you have to keep secret for so many reasons. It's, you know, it's about the the relationship of it. It's not just about the fact that, you know, Jamaica as an environment is homophobic and that's the that's the whole film. You know right, what I mean? Right, right, right. I did I mean to go through that process with the writer, the the was she um, you know, her, how receptive was was she in your process of trying to to bring bring that to the table, or was that already there? So I'm gonna uh, let's say Williams is really great. You know, if you look her up, she's um I think I think she has a an article in the Gleaner about mm -hmm. about writing Traytown. Sure. Um, she considers herself primarily a screenwriter, so you know she doesn't. Um, you know, if, like a lot of people, they're like a writer director, but she's right. She's writer, a screenwriter, and she's you know she's just so receptive to any amount of um, ways that she has to think about the story. Mm -hmm. You know, like not just like the social political implications of you know certain scenes or setups, but it's also and or like more practical worries of like you know uh, they have gotten. 
funding for the the short film and it was under the understanding that they had to present it from the central character's point of view and then we had drafts that had gone through um like shifted perspectives and they had brought various things to the like uh, her understanding of the story that she was writing mm -hmm. but you know every time that you have to come you have to you know send back your notes there's just like there's other things that are, you know probably more material or you know metatextual or anything any number of things that you would talk her through she would understand that she's learning something about her own work mm -hmm. and i think that was like for me you know it was like the first short film that i actually worked on as a story editor right, right. you know you like you don't want to you don't want to can i i don't know if i can curse but you don't want to mess <laughs> up you know what i mean and so it's just like you know, but she was like, I think she was just like, just, I still speak to her, she's great, but it's just like, she really understands that it's a process and that, you know, there's no point in getting down on mm -hmm. not being there just yet because, you know, you don't know how many drafts it's going to take, but when you get there, it's because you got there. Yeah. No, well, this, this brings me to a, a, a question about, you know, something else that you brought up in, in our, our first conversation. You talked about, you know, the research aspect of the film process. Um, and that you said that as a, uh, you know, that there's a, an interesting dynamic between researcher and subject that affects the, the nature of the story. Um, can you talk about that a little bit? Like, how, how has that come up for you in, in your work? this this um, dynamic between researcher and subject okay so um i think i think this goes back to what i was saying earlier about for i think a lot of filmmakers are very um concerned with being able to tell their own stories because especially jamaican and caribbean artists they understand what it is to be the object mm -hmm. you know they understand what it is to be looked at and to not really be engaged with in any like um where they have the sort of like dynamic of like an equal like power dynamic of like i am a person and you're a person and we are both objects and subjects and you know interlocutor and with that in mind i think a lot of jamaicans artists in general because we are very, we're very political, we're very political people in general, but people are very concerned with trying to accomplish something very important, not just for them, but for the culture. And, you know, that does, I think, lead a lot of people to tackle subject matter that they don't really engage with. Because I'll say, you know, like the film, the film scene is, because film is expensive, film is very bourgeois here. Because it's just, you know, it costs a lot of money to be involved in film for like, from like every, every, every step of the way. Even if you're like just writing, yeah, you can sit down with like a computer screen, but then to like network, to like go out and meet people and to like have the time to devote, like that's, it's all a cost. And so when people, I think, try to um, delve into subject matter that they're not really, you know, personally um, familiar with, it's just like, it's good to want to do that. And it's good to like, you know, think about your characters as people, but it's just like, what else are you doing for the community that you're trying to represent? Because, you know, it's, I think this is just something that has to be sort of like um, like brought into a practice as a writer and a filmmaker, where it's just like you really need to think about having a relationship with the people that you're trying to make your you know the subject of your film. It's just like who on your like who on your team is of you know has that background like. What, what involvement do they have with the script? In what way can you credit them on the, on the work? And, you know, I think for me, I mean, especially now with the pandemic, it's really, it's really difficult to get out and meet people. But for me, 
like I know with that in mind, like I just tended to be a lot more um, interior like focused mm -hmm. because you know I don't I didn't feel that I was qualified to be really making any statement about something that I would not engage with in a like a material manner. But it's interesting, you know, you said that, you know, you know, it's not necessarily a bad thing, you know, and certainly, especially in our part of the world, there's been a long tradition of, of the bourgeoisie feeling the responsibility of representing the working poor, right? So it's not, it's not necessarily a paradigm that is unique to, to filmmaking. I think it is, it seems to be more illustrative of a, of a larger, uh, complex, you know, that, that governs many different areas of society, you know. Um, but in this case, I mean, it's, it, we, we are talking about the researcher subject relationship as it relates to fiction, narrative fiction, not to documentary. Um, you don't work in documentary. You don't really work in that area at all. So for, for narrative fiction, if if not those characters, because that's that's the characters that, you know, those kind of character sets and scenarios are what feed the the expectation of what Jamaican and Caribbean film should or or, or could be. Mm -hmm. um, do you see that starting to shift? That there are more stories that are perhaps more more idiosyncratic or or looking more interior than or interior into the character as opposed to exterior into their their situation so actually yeah and the first film that comes to mind i think i think everybody should know what i'm talking about it's flight by kia moses um it's like a it's a short film i think it had come out two years ago now two or three years ago and the thing i mean i cried like the first time i watched it but you know it's just like the thing about it it's it's a very, very touching story because it's it's you understand what the character wants immediately, and you understand how that changes the way that they see the world around them. And you know, it is a like it's a dynamic that you can take out of, I guess, like the environment that the characters exist in, but. I mean, I guess for people who don't know, Flight is about a young boy trying to, in like the inner city of Kingston, who's, who's dreaming of um, being an astronaut and getting to the moon. And, you know, this whole film is about him, you know, trying to make a spaceship. And the thing I really appreciate about Flight is just that when you're watching it and you understand the characters, um, economic situation and you understand what feels possible for them because of the specificity of where they live mm -hmm. and where they're from. But the film, like they don't exist. The purpose of the characters is not to be poor. You know what I mean? It's not like, it's not and, a And that, that yeah. is a really crucial difference, you know? Um, you know, this, this idea of, I think what's the term you used? Um, uh, grief pornography or something. I can't remember exactly what the term was you used when we when we spoke, but there is this real reliance about a kind of garish representation of poverty, right? That seems to be almost um, seductive in its intention. You know, it, it isn't, it, and and it, it has permeated not just not just our images, but I think our um, lyrical sentiment as well, not just in Jamaica either, you know. Um, and I think that's it is a crucial thing about dealing with poverty as either as either a subject matter or a context in film is that if the if the characters are completely subsumed into that subject, then they cease to be human. And the very dehumanizing aspect of poverty that I think you know, films that deal with that try are trying to address the, the films end up doing it themselves, you know, that the person becomes part of the backdrop as opposed to a living human being um in 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 a situation. And the situation is not the thing that defines them, right? 
Yeah, I think kind of the thing is, I guess like the sentiment that I always kind of get from like, uh, it's kind of, it's very similar to like those films about starving children in Africa. And it's also, there's just like this undercurrent of, you know, poor people can teach us so much about our humanity. And it's like, Am I your intended audience? You know what I mean? Yeah. yeah, yeah like that's that's the thing that that's always like I think is like a little bit concerning is just watching these sort of things. It's just like I don't know what that means that mm -hmm. this is, you know, I have to I'm watching this person go through you know, it, it, these things happen. I'm not saying that you can't depict them, but it's just like from what what position I, does that filmmaker come to, to validate that perspective? But it's not even just that, like validating that perspective, it's just that I, especially in the Caribbean context, because it is, you know, we're so stratified a society and it is so difficult to screen films in general. It's like, am I the intended audience or is the, the like, at what stage did you consider the, you know, the kind of background that the character has that's your intended audience. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. Well, I think, you yeah. know, with you not only work as a writer, you work as a, um, as a, you do design as well, correct? That I, on, on these, uh, this one film that you shared, um, Poison Berry. Oh, right. So, right? um, your yeah. role on that was you were. I was art director for that. Art director, right. So your your intervention into the story space was a bit different. It was more visual in this case. Yeah. So that was actually Can we can we uh, just pull up those two poisonberry images? So yeah, that was actually a really great um, student film by Hannah Ann. I think she was the filmmaker in uh, student filmmaker residence mm -hmm. at Barnard College in 2019. Um, so it's on YouTube for anybody who wants to watch it. It's um, it's about this young girl. She is on her way to school in the morning. Her dog eats um, some fruit that she can't identify. And she spends the whole day worrying that he's gonna die because of it. And so we get the, a lot of scenes about her sort of internal strife about and guilt about what she's done. But then it's sort of like very tragically, you know, um, there's, a, there's a school shooting at her while, she's, while she is, you know, going throughout her day. And it's just put into perspective, I guess, like the things that you know, worry kids have to worry about in the states. So can you can you talk mm -hmm. about how you you bring your your acumen for narrative into this work? Um, how do you how do you develop um, art direction with story in mind? So it's, I mean, it's actually a really really great learning process because I mean, it's the, the first time I had something that I was art director on produced. But you know, the, it's 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 like the opposite side of the coin for um, being a story editor, where you are trying to establish the like it's like the narrative intent behind the story. But then when you're art director, it's like you are presented with the script, and you have to speak through the the director what it is that they the feeling that they're trying to um, visualize. And for this one in particular, because, you know, we have um, a real world and an imagined world, which is, you know, that's like primarily what I was focused on. Like there was, you know, there's like a, a World War One era um, hospital scene. And, um, you know, like I sort of, well, my influence is like a lot of like 80s music video, like dog funeral and, you know, it's speaking with the director and she's trying to really get into like the headscape of like a, a young, like a young girl who's very concerned with, you know, she's taking care of somebody and with the, the guilt that she feels. And she's trying to, I guess, like um, 
cope with a lot of like these really large emotions. And she's like, how do you visualize something like that? You know, she has she has it written in this, the screenplay that it's you know similar. This is um, it's similar to an old kind of um, film. So you know, it's just like, what what does the lighting look like if it's we're we're trying to get into right. a sense of concern and helplessness or? But do you feel like you are you have in that in that particular production? I mean, did you? Were you were you just kind of following the indicators in the script, or did you feel like you were bringing your own uh, creative impulse into that? Oh into yeah, that world? I, uh, I definitely felt you know that um, having just like having the conversation alone because Akana she was like a really re receptive and you know like she's open to so many ideas. And but at the same time, she's also very deliberate about I think the decisions that she makes. So when she hears something that makes sense, like she's like, we're gonna start developing that together. You know, it's a it's a it's a constant conversation. Right, and, and I you know I think this is one of the things I find so so wonderful about working in film when it works well, is that it truly is a collaborative process. You know, like it really is about a, a group of artists sharing ideas. And, and out of that sharing comes this kind of unified vision of, of the world or of the human psyche. Um, so he, you, you function as a story editor, you function as an art director, but you've also um, directed and, and written as well, right? Yeah, so um, when I... So um, let's, let's maybe show, show a clip of, of your, your directing work. Um, should we show the side effects clip? No. no? Which one do you <laughs> we want? We can, we can. It's just, it's just like anything you show, I'm going to be embarrassed. <laughs> <laughs> um, all right. Let's see. Maybe. Oh, well, let's, let's show um, once more with feeling. Let's show that okay. clip. That's the first one, um, Philip. Number one. And you wrote this piece as well, yeah? Yeah. So I wrote this my sophomore year, my second year. So I always, you know, I kind of always feel like, you know, the director, even though the director is, you know, really responsible for everything, the real kind of, you know, gut work of the director is, is to deal with actor performances, you know, to really guide actors towards, um, a level of emotional conviction that is going to make the film work. Um, can you talk to me about that? Uh, how you how you approach your actors? Oh man, it was like a really great experience. I don't know if I did all that well as a director, but um, you know, a lot of the the school that I went to, a lot of the students there are like intimidatingly accomplished for a lot of reasons and you know for in a lot of fields and so a lot of people that I spoke to you know they're they've already been experienced actors for you know how many years um but the thing is it's at the same time they're students and they're very overworked and they have a lot of other things to think about and it was really, you know, it's not like I could really, it's a very verbose script, to be honest with you. And I couldn't ask them 
to rehearse because they just didn't have the time mm -hmm. for like the headspace. And especially at the time of the semester that we had filmed it, we like to really ask them to dedicate more time than they were already giving to me for free. And, you know, even with that, it's just like you try and speak to them, you know, like, just like before you go into a scene, it's just like, you know, what is it that you, like, what is it that you're, you got out of it when you're going through it? And what is it that, you know, I, you know, when I was writing this, what I, what I heard or what I, you know, envisioned and when we're, going through it, it's just like, can we, like, just like on a practical matter, can we sound like we're not reading the script? <laughs> you know what I mean? <laughs> but uh, that's, that's kind of what I'm getting at, is like, how do you, how do you get them from that place where they're just reciting lines to where they're delivering, you know, um, some level of credibility? Because, mm -hmm. you know, the, the girl in the bathroom in that scene does deliver, you know, I believe her. So how did you get her, get her there? Well, Indigo, she's, she was just great. I mean, like from like, we actually did um, like have to ca like cast um, for that role. And, you know, I think from the outset, she, the way that she, you know, interpreted the lines that we gave her, it was like, you know, this is somebody who, you know, has like a, can like has the kind of intensity that you wanted, but also knew how to like, um, halfway repress it, which is what the character needs. Mm -hmm. But then it's also, you know, when you're on set, you kind of have to be very, I think for me, I have to be very specific about the language I use, about what it is that I'm, I want from, you know, cause you can say anxious, but that doesn't, and you get an idea, you know what I mean? So maybe some, some actors I think are more, you know, very imaginative and they can latch onto that. But for some people, when they're, you know, they're looking to a director, they're looking for direction. So it's just like, it's not just anxiety, you know, it's just like, this is probably like the first panic attack that you're having for, you know, for the day, but you have these like every week, you know what I mean? Like, what is it exactly that you want them to consider for the character? And just be about, for me, I really just try and be about as specific as possible. And then at the same time, I think it's just like, it was just, it was just everybody on that team that I had, you know, asked a favor from, like they were just so professional and they were just so committed to the, the you know, the role that they had that I think I just really, I really did luck out, honestly. Like there's not, it's not really, and I think that's for me, like that was like really um, gratifying because I think that's the kind of director that I'd like to be where you're, you feel comfortable in letting people, you know, experiment yeah. and like uh, think smart, about. Smart directors yeah. say ninety percent of their work is casting, right? If they cast, <laughs> <I remember. laughs> so you know, like I really, yeah. I really, really lucked out. I think with the the cast and the crew that I had. So, um, and this, uh, do you want to show alternative vlogger? Oh uh, yeah. Talk about that? Um, we can show any any clip that you want to show is fine. All right, let's show that one. Can we show that one? Um, my videos with a bare face. So I've spent the past two or three hours. So I like to start all of my videos with a bare face. So I've spent the past two or three hours washing it with my tears. This is like really my holy grail, guys. Like you can use them for anything. Uh, generalized anxiety, stress, imposter syndrome, or just the crushing loneliness of the human condition. Um, you know, I like to cover my face like three or four times a day. So, you know, you can use it for really anything. All right, tell me about this one, Rachel. Where did, um, where did this come from? What was your role on it? How did this play um, out? This is a, this is a, this is its own narrative in itself. I was, the school I went to, it's, you know, it's um, a very cutthroat environment. It's not very supportive. And my mother had recently been diagnosed with cancer and I was very depressed. I was like, <laughs> I was like insanely depressed. And it's very hard, I think, to operate in um, a lot of, modes you know academically and creatively and the thing is you know sometimes when you just sort of um 
veg out in that state, you just watch a lot of YouTube. Mm -hmm. And I actually didn't at this time, I didn't watch a lot of um, like beauty vlogs. But the thing is like, I was very familiar with the format and it's right. very, it's very consistent, you know, because it works. It's like a formula, like they, people are trying to tap into like the sort of parasocial relationship that they have with their viewers. Right, right, right. And, you know, like this is something that is, like I kind of, I, 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 <laughs> the thing is, it's like, it's just, it's supposed to be like a very soothing um, sort of media content to just like consume and learn right. from. And I think, you know, just um, a lot of the things that I was thinking about, the situation that I was in, the you know, the school that I, I went to and just the, the fact that you're still kind of, you still have to function mm -hmm. in a lot of ways. If that's what the, that the, whole, the whole video is actually about, where it's, you know, it's just like if you were so depressed that you had to just try and get people to not ask you about how badly, you know, that you're doing, and, but you know, like that's the whole point is just that you're, this is your depression phase basically. And so I wrote that script. I wasn't intended as a director. I was part of um, a sketch comedy. Um, that's Columbia, and Columbia University, well, low budget. It was no budget at the time, sketch show. So like they would have like a rotation of directors. And right. Like, First director we had just like didn't understand the format at all. She's like, this can't work. Nobody would watch this. It's like, wow. YouTube videos are like forty eight minutes long, of just people's faces. You know, it's a big thing, and people tune into it. And if you don't, um, you don't get it. You don't get it. You yeah. don't get it. You don't get it. And if you don't adhere to the format, the joke is kind of lost because it's just like it doesn't. Exist it doesn't play. Outside. It doesn't exist outside of this um, yeah. setting, and. Um, so, I mean, like, it was like a really, like, the club itself at the time was, you know, they were very, um, protective, I think, of everyone's creative vision. And they said, like, look, you know, like, if it is just so incompatible with what it is that you're trying to say as a writer, maybe we should mm -hmm. just, you know, just put it aside for a while and then, um, Wait for another director. So, yeah. So, but eventually they had asked me to direct it. So you wrote it and directed it? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. All right, Rachel, I want to um, give, give the viewers a chance to, to talk to you. So um, and we're, we're all heading towards our, our mark. So if we could have the first question, uh, Philip. Okay. Have you had the opportunity to connect with a regional filmmaking community? And is, and is growing that community something you're interested in? So actually, very recently, I got in contact with Isle, Isle as an I S L E and Indies. So they're um, they're like a up and coming um, film marketing startup, and they're very invested in connecting um, Caribbean audiences to Caribbean film because it's actually very difficult to stream a lot of the things that come out of the Caribbean. Like, you know, just for example, the Trinidad and Tobago Film Festival was, you know, is only available for the English speaking Caribbean. Right. And so, you know, people like in Toronto, I mean, for a lot of reasons, you know, it's just like practical issues, but you can understand that it's very hard to find a lot of the work that people do. So the person that I was first in contact with was Rachel Osborne. She's based in Toronto and you know, in like the brief period of time that I've been speaking with them, I've been in touch with people from like Guadeloupe and, you know, um, I think New York, like, just like, you know, like what is the, the things that they're thinking about and the issues? It's been like very, very in terms individual. of distribution and, and um, kind of production models. Yeah, like it's really, like everyone's like has a very similar concerns, you know, like the specifics of it, you know, are different from country to country. But it's just like the issue is like most people they can't connect with the work that they'd like to and that they are trying in their own like sort of like piecemeal ways to get in touch or like to bring the audience together. Mm -hmm. So it's happening very slowly, I think is to answer the question properly. 
Okay, um, I think we have it. Here we are. Rachel, are there other young Jamaican filmmakers with whom you are having conversations as a way to build bridges into the Jamaican film community? Mm, so it's like, I guess like build bridges within the, the film community. Mm -hmm. So I think I, well, you, you talk mm -hmm. a lot about your, your networking experience and how important that is. Um, are there Okay. Um, are there people like in your in your age group that are kind of on the come up in the scene that you are you're um, connecting with? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So I mean, like, there's Lute, like I mentioned. I think she's only a couple years older than I am. And then there was somebody I actually went. This to is the school. the writer from from mm -hmm. Yeah. And then there's um, my well, he's actually my friend from high school. So, but um, Hannick James. Um, and then there's. Caleb, I don't want to butcher his name, but it's Caleb Daguilar. Um, I think he's doing his master's at Goldsmiths. Mm -hmm. So I think that's like on an individual basis. Yes, it's very difficult, I think, to answer some of these questions because um, I haven't been back home all that long and most of it has been under pandemic <laughs> circumstances. Right. Um, but, you know, I have to really, um, really credit JAFTA, I think, for a lot of the work that they do because, you know, they're so invested in fomenting a community amongst, uh, you know, practicing professionals. Right. And, you know, even if you consider yourself like an emerging um, filmmaker, they're, you know, they, they're they really consistent uh, about trying to um, provide opportunities for people to really think about the, you know, from like different, from different angles. And, you know, like, I really pray for the day that I'll be able to see people from there again in person. But I think a lot of the, the initiatives that they have, you know, that's it, already, I think, it's just like, it's just, it's the, like the, the results are there. You know what I mean? Like JAFTA is just mm -hmm. like, they, they're, they're really- They're doing, they're doing what is their they're work. Yeah, like they're serious about it. And it's, you know, it's very heartening that they want to support filmmaking and they, you know, they really put their money where their mouth is. They're, they're just great. All right, uh, next question. All right, at this emerging point in your career, having delved into writing, directing, and art direction, is there one area you gravitate to most or are you keen on continuing to explore all? Um, I just like, again, pandemic conditions, I've been doing a lot of writing, but I miss directing so much. Um, so I think, um, and I think about long-term, I would be like a writer director, hopefully, you know, right. but I do also really appreciate um, art direction. You know, I think, that like that experience of just being a support a support member, you know what I mean? Right. It's, I think like when I function in a mode as a writer director, you can get very like this is my vision, this is my work, and <laughs> sometimes you just want to work in you know in service of uh, someone else's vision. And right. That is you know it is just I love it. I really do. So I really don't think at this point in time or even in the near future that I would choose between any, any one or the other. Okay. Yeah. All right. And I think this is our, our last question. Hi, Rachel. Um, you alluded to the high cost of film in Jamaica. Would you say there are there is currently a high demand for persons in the field there? Um, yeah, that's, I think it's there's definitely more than I think a lot of people outside of the, the creative industry really understand. There's a lot of positions that go into um, filmmaking, whether it's, you know, on just like a narrative basis, a documentary basis, a commercial, corporate. Um, there's a lot of, there are a lot of positions and it's not just, um, you know, like production or development. There's marketing, there's distribution, there's publicity. Mm -hmm. And these are a lot of aspects of the film industry that have kind of not been addressed, like in in a you know in a, in a serious capacity. Like the, the back end stuff. Yeah, you know, it's not just it's not just um, production. Being, like being on set and you know working with actors, it's also reaching your audience. You know, 
you know, um, navigating, you know, engagement and markets and festivals and there, you know, in most in just like established industries, you have people who are, that's their, their job function. Their function. Yeah. And we just don't really have them here yet. Well, I, I, you know, every time I hear someone use the term film industry for our, for what we're going on in the region right now, I'm a little um, apprehensive to concede that because for that very reason is that we just simply don't have an industrial structure that warrants naming it as such. You know, we're perhaps, as a friend of mine says, we're a sector, but not an industry. But it sounds like um, what JAFTA is doing, um, and what, what the scene is evolving into, there is a real recognition that, you know, the, the kind of less glamorous aspects or less um, cr uh, creative aspects of the filmmaking practice um, are being started to be considered as equally important. Right. That's great news. Well, Rachel, thank you so much. It was really a pleasure to meet you. Um, and I'm very much looking forward to your next steps. What What's next on, on the horizon for you? Do, what's your, your kind of next? So I have a short film that I wanted to film, but then, um, restrictions rose again so it didn't seem very safe to have a lot of so many people in thick um For sure. small settings so i have another one that i've written and i'm starting to look to get funding to actually it's like, a, like a big i was hoping for the first one to be like a skeleton budget skeleton crew like i'm used to All but right. i i think i should actually try um a budget <laughs> so, <laughs> yeah hopefully that's hopefully that something will happen Okay, okay. All right, guys, well, well thanks so much for, for joining us. Um, in closing today's salon, I'd like to once again thank uh, the Catapult Partners, the American Friends of Jamaica, Kingston Creative and Fresh Milk. Um, and also, please remember to join us for the next Catapult um, Lockdown Virtual Salon at 1 p.m. on Tuesday, the 13th of October um, with Dr. Marsha Pierce who will be in dialogue with um, Jenna Lindo um, and Esther. Gina, Gina Lindo. Gina. Gina. Gina, Gina, Gina. Lindo. Apologies. And Esther Chen. Thanks a lot, everybody. Um, remember also that all of these conversations are being archived on Fresh Milk's YouTube channel and are available um, immediately upon completion. Take care, everyone. Don't forget to subscribe.